Well, welcome. Welcome. Lord be with you. And also with you. Uh, we are doing something new and different uh, than we have done in the past. Used to our services were recorded and then broadcasted later on, on Facebook and the internet and web page. Uh, we are for the fourth time ever right now live streaming. And so I want to spend not only a few minutes welcoming you today, but to welcome those people that might be watching us from wherever they are. Uh, we had a, on, on uh, Christmas Eve, we live streamed our 11 o'clock service and we had about 30 people tune in. On Sunday morning, we live streamed our 11 o'clock Sunday morning service. We had about 99 people tune in. And so uh, it just became apparent to me, I've not, it have not been perfected yet, but how you do it is you go to Facebook and when you get to Facebook, you'll see a link that says GoPro because that's the kind of camera we use. And there's a note there that says live stream our 11 o'clock service by clicking here. I need to get it to where there's less steps, but that's where we are today. Uh, the one from last night, the sound and everything like that was good. So uh, for whoever you are, wherever you are, welcome and we're glad you're with us today. Uh, the only announcement I have, and this is for the people, that, as I said last night, this is for people that are members of the church, who are regular attenders of the church, who are only once in a while attenders of the church, and who might have never been to the church, but are watching this right now on YouTube or on uh, Facebook, the, uh, on January the 14th, we're going to have an all-church town hall meeting at 10.30 on a Saturday morning here. I want, we're, we're hopefully going to get everybody to come as we talk about what we've got to do in the future, where we are right now, what's going on in the church, uh, where we are financially as well as spiritually in other ways like that. Uh, we're going to meet at about 10.30. We're going to have some cold cuts for some sandwiches. We'll be out of here easily by noon, maybe even by 11.30, but... Uh, I want everybody that we the Saturday people, Sunday people, once again, people who've never been here, people that come all the time, uh, to come and join us as we get together and uh, and talk a little bit about that. Uh, other than that, that's the only thing I have. So uh, today, Ann is out on vacation, experiencing uh, New Year's Day somewhere else, and I'm going to ask AJ if you'll play something for us to warm our hearts and get us ready to worship. stand as we sing together God of the Ages. Thank you. 
be seated. Our first scripture reading on this very first day of a brand new year comes from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, in a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You remain seated. You may remain seated now as we sing together, O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Sunday of the new year. It's the first Sunday of January, and it's that time when we gather together to celebrate at the Lord's table. In the United Methodist Church, all are welcome to come to the table. We don't ask questions of you. We just invite you to come. We just ask that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another together. 
Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We've broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm so thankful that we have finished last year and it's, we're saying bye to it. And we're saying hello to new things and new exciting things. And I think it's going to be a great year. As of today, we have a new bishop. Bishop Cynthia Harvey is our new bishop and we're very excited about that. And I'm sure you will be hearing and seeing things from and about her in the days to come. This time I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and all Let us pray. Gracious God, we have been blessed with so much. Open our eyes that we might see the pain and suffering around us. Open our hearts that we might be there for people in need. And give us the strength that only you can provide through the Holy Spirit to get us through tough times and bring us to a time when we can fulfill your call for our ministry to be the hands and feet of Jesus for our community and for the whole world. Accept our gifts, accept our tithes, accept our offerings. And God will glorify you with every penny. Amen. Amen. As you're able, would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? Reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 and following. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations we gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep in his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer him, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who were members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those in his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison and you did not visit me. 
Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I tell you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And you may be seated. In 2002, I decided to take a winter class in seminary. I went to Mexico City. I worked in a church. I went to class. There were 13 of us there that spoke English and 75 that didn't. So we heard everything through little headphones where the teacher would teach in Spanish and we'd hear it translated for us in English. I wasn't very smart about that trip. It was January, it was actually this week of January, it was the baptism of the Lord week that I was there. It didn't occur to me that Mexico City is at 7,000 feet. I was going to Mexico. I went down, got a burr haircut, took some comfortable clothes, thought I was going to be in a warm and toasty environment. The warmest it ever got in the building where we were staying was 50. The floors were concrete, the walls were cinder block. It was cold. There were no heaters. The professor, whose name was Alejandro Boda, was from Argentina. He read the scripture. I gotta tell you, I heard it different when I was suffering just a little bit. I heard it differently when I wasn't comfortable. And it occurs to me that sometimes we don't hear the gospel the way we could hear it because frankly, we're pretty comfortable. I heard these messages four times in 10 verses, Jesus says, Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up and my mama told me to do something four times in a row, it meant it was kind of important. This is one of the only times, maybe the only time I can think of where Jesus doesn't, a lot of times you, he makes a statement and the disciples say, Lord, get with us and explain to us what it meant. He doesn't say that here. And friends, this is the, the most upsetting thing about the scripture. This is not a scripture being said to believers versus non-believers. This is being said to the believers. Matthew is written for the believers. It's written for the Jews. These were good, faithful, religious folk. It might have been a little shocking to them. When they found out that some of that good stuff they were doing in their lives, they were doing it for God. They were doing it to God. And it might have been really shocking for some of the ones that always said their prayers, that always did the right thing, that were always in temple every Sunday, to find out that when they haven't done it, they were not doing it for God. For me, the issue is here. The, four times we're told, what are the essentials? You notice, nobody says, go forward and get in front of the church, and bury your soul, and confess your sin. He doesn't say that. It takes imperfect people who are not really aware of what they're doing and say, you people, if you've done it for the least of these, you've done it for me. I came home from that experience. A friend of mine was a preacher. I know a few of those. I said to him, I said, you ever read Matthew 25, verses 31 and following? He said, yeah, I read it, but it makes me feel guilty. I don't read it very often. Makes me feel guilty too. Maybe this year, because of my focus on uh, all of the pain and suffering that's going on in our community because of, of the people I know and people that have been struggling that I know, maybe I'm more aware that when Jesus says here, you did it for the least of these, you did it for me, and they weren't aware of it, I realize there's a lot of pain and suffering that I'm not willing to look at. How about you? Amen. It's a lot more comfortable to live our lives. We got food to eat. 
We got a car to get where we want to go. Let me tell you, I'm more and more aware of how many people don't. Have to depend on somebody to take them somewhere to, to do something for them. They have to rely on friendships. And where are those friends? Who are those people? I mean, I would bet you that there's somebody that you know right now that just your smiling face would lift their spirits. I'm betting that there's somebody that a hand out to them, not with necessarily money, but to say, what can I do for you? What do you need? Maybe what you need is a handshake or a hug. Do you realize that there are people in your lives right now that your very presence in their life lifts their spirits? So what worries me about the church is we spend an inordinate amount of time deciding if people got baptized by the right formula. If they say the right things, if they have a fish on their car, if they wear a cross around their neck, and we don't spend the right amount of time recognizing the pain and suffering in the world that Jesus Christ sent the church and us as part of the church into the world to change. And I know it's easy to say, well, I'm just one person, I can't make a difference. In fact, I've even thought that sometimes. And sometimes in conversations with people, they tell me what a difference it's made in their life to know me. They feel better when I'm around. And I don't think it's an isolated case. So the church... Big C Church, that's all of us, have tended to become more internal, worried about how we're going to survive and what we're going to do and whether we're doing it the right way, than we have external where we're reaching out to people everywhere to offer them the saving grace, love, and mercy of Jesus Christ. We tend to be uh, thinkers like with a quid pro quo. We'll do this for you if you'll do this for us. Now what this scripture says. And as I read through the Ecclesiastes passage, I began to think this morning about what New Year's means to us. It's not about resolutions. But sometimes it's important to know that God does see everything as part of God's plan. And so the writer of Ecclesiastes says, for everything there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Well, after you pass about 50, you start to realize you've got less time to go than you already had. There is a time to die. But there's also a time to be born. And what does that mean? It means new life. We're not dead yet. And it's about time we were reborn into believing that the efforts we make, the stuff we do can change the world. A time to plan and a time to pluck up. One of the biggest struggles I've ever seen in the church is we're just refused to pluck up. We've been doing it that way, so we're going to keep doing it that way. Are we? You know, there's a saying, if you keep doing what you've always done, you keep getting what you always got. On January the 14th, we're going to meet here. I hope a lot of people. We're going to talk about that. A time to kill and a time to heal. Are we more concerned with healing than we should be, or are we not concerned enough with healing? Now, I don't know about you, but I can look around our community, and there's a lot of broken relationships. And some of them can be fixed. But healing can still take place. 
a time to weep and a time to laugh. We spent an inordinate amount of time in the last two or three months weeping about the people leaving the United Methodist Church. We need to quit weeping about that. They're gone. Now we're going to do what we're going to do. The stuff we were raised to do, the stuff we've been taught to do, to reach out, to change the world, to make disciples, to love one another, to demonstrate God's love, mercy, and grace. We've had a time to mourn. I think it's time to dance. A time to throw stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. Friends, we've got to let go of some of the old ways. Why? Because what they tell me is that the Gen Z people, whoever they are, those kids over there, have an attention span of about 30 seconds. Well, let me tell you, the way we've done church for years doesn't work with a 30-second attention span. Having a talking head sit up here for 20 minutes is kind of boring to some people. I remember when I was visiting the Catholic Church when I was in seminary, I had to go to the, uh, another Christian denomination. The only one I could find that met when we didn't meet was Catholic. I met this couple when I was there. I wrote a paper about it. She had been Church of Christ. He was Roman Catholic. They got married, so they decided to go to the Church of Christ for a while and to go to the Roman Catholic for a while and see what would happen in the middle. If you've never been to a Catholic service, they typically last exactly 60 minutes. In that 60 minutes, there will be some songs they sing. There will be some scriptures. In fact, four, every single week, four scriptures, a psalm, an Old Testament reading, an epistle, and the gospel. Somehow in that, they manage to get in a sermon that's only eight minutes long, usually, and they serve communion every week, and they do it in 60 minutes. The guy that had grown up Catholic went to the Church of Christ Church where they sat still for an hour, listened to a preacher go on and on and on, and he said, I can't stand it. Because in the Catholic Church, you're going to sit for a while, stand up for a while, kneel for a while, you move around for a little while, you, know, you go home, you've been exercised. No wonder they're growing when other denominations aren't because it's interesting what goes on. A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to rest, uh, to tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silent, a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Great words from Ecclesiastes. Mix those words up with the words from Jesus Christ. Feed the hungry, clothe the sick, visit the imprisoned, take care of others, put others first if you want to have joy in the kingdom. Now we do a pretty good job of that here. I'm not saying we don't, but I, I'm going to tell you that I think we need to realize 2023 is coming at us in a whole different way than 2013 did or 2003 did or 1993 did. I grew up in the Methodist church where I knew for sure we were going to have a responsive reading. We were going to have a hymn. The preacher was going to tell a joke or a poem. He was going to have three points in a sermon and we were going to go home. I remember almost nothing from any of them. The only one I really remember clearly is when the preacher set up and quoted a song by Chumba Wumba. Y'all don't know who that is. It had a word in it, a little line in it that said, I get knocked down, I get back up again. And that was his point. But he never did listen to the rest of the words because it was never should have been something we put in church. <laughs> you want to know how to get to heaven? Do heaven's work now. Amen. You want to know how to experience heaven? Find out what it's like now. I grew up with this kind of Santa Claus theology. If you live right and you do well, then you'll get to be in heaven. 
You know, God never promises it's not going to hurt, that we're going to be, everything's going to work out fine. God never promises that we're not going to have suffering. In fact, Jesus tells you, if you follow me, you're going to suffer. And the disciples, you know, they're just like us. Oh yeah, Lord, we're willing to do that until the real suffering comes along. And then we, just like the disciples, deny him and go about doing our thing. I'm less concerned with what a sinner you were than what trip you're on now. I'm less concerned with whether you ever said the sinner's prayer or made the right vow in front of the preacher or some church than whether you're living the life of that's just described in those four or ten verses. They just haunt me in my head all the time. Ever since I heard that scripture back in Mexico, I've been trying to live through that. If you want to know what defines Pastor Jack's ministry, it's Matthew 25, verses, verses 31 and following. Uh, probably You'll probably hear it from me more as we figure out how to go through this coming year. Are we doing that? And by we, I don't mean the church. I mean, we've got to individually be doing it, and then we collectively do it. And when we collectively do it, we have power. And yeah, I'm silly about it. I think we can change the world. I think we can make a huge difference in this community, in the greater community, maybe in the whole world. We're not limited anymore by who shows up here because we have social media. We can be on there. We can talk about our church, where we go, what a difference it made. Maybe the preacher got lucky and had a good message that week. Maybe there was a good solo. Maybe the prayer really moved me. I don't know. I don't know. Because even though I'm here, that's my job, and you're here because that's your following or calling, the work to be done here is God's work. The one that does the saving is God, not Pastor Jack. Don't put me on a pedestal somewhere. I'll say I'm going to do all the right things and I'll be sinning before I go home. To differentiate sin is judgment. We're not supposed to do that. Well, boy, it's hard, isn't it? To look down our nose at others, that's easy. To read this time for everything passage and realize sometimes embracing doesn't mean put your arms around them. It means to take on the effort to do what they're going to do. My colleague Russell Hall is leaving pulpit ministry to go be the president or the director or something of a group that helps homeless teens find a place to live. I told him, I said, you got to come tell us about it. We need to know about that. Because you know what? Since Harvey, I think they told us at the school district, the number of what are considered homeless children in the school district in our community has just blown up. Now, they're living somewhere, but they're not living in a permanent home. They're living with Aunt Sally or Uncle Fred or Grandpa, whatever. But they're homeless. Do you see them? See, that's the issue with these guys that were doing it right. They didn't see what they were doing. They couldn't see that they, they, were, they were fulfilling a need. They couldn't see, when, oh Jesus, when did we feed the hungry? When did we clothe the naked? Well, let me tell you, when you guys did it, thanks to Olivia Troutman, we put lots of blankets outside in the cold weather. Thanks to other people in our church, we put lots of food out there for people that were hungry. No judgment. No time frame. They don't have to sign up. They don't have to lie and tell us where they are or do anything else. If it's there, they can take it. If they have extra, they can leave it. What do we get out of it? We fulfill those four verses, right? We feed the hungry. We clothe the naked. 
And sometimes I think we look at this prison thing, you know, well, that means I got to load up and go down to the jail in Dayton or somewhere else and visit people. No, let me tell you, friends, there are people imprisoned by debt. There are people imprisoned by their lifestyle. There are people imprisoned by the culture we live in. And we can visit them anytime we want. All we have to do is reach out with love, mercy, and grace to offer them what we've been given, free grace. We don't deserve it. None of us earned it. And we absolutely are not qualified to get it. Amen. If we start there, then where are we to judge anybody else? Oh, we quickly can say, oh, by the grace of God, there go I. But it's true. I never had a DUI, but I deserved one. I never lost a job for doing anything bad at work, but I did some bad stuff at work. By God's grace, I'm here today. Imperfect, broken, worried, worried about our church, worried about my health, worried about everything that goes on around us, worried about friendships that are broken, worried about the whole thing. But I'm here, broken as I am, to tell you that God loves you and God loves the community around us and God wants all of God's children to feel that love, mercy, and grace. And I need your help to do it. Together we can do it, can't we? Yeah. Alone, it's hard. When I was a trainer in the sales world, I used to try to get people to go in couples, pairs. Let me tell you, when you're out doing cold calling by yourself, it's pretty easy to get out of the car, walk up to the door, grab the doorknob, look at it and say, oh, they didn't want to buy anything anyway, go sit back down in the car. But when there was two, and what God says three, what I found was there's a little competition going on. I'm not going to show my fear in front of somebody else. We need to hold each other accountable. But we need to more than that lift each other up. So many times, guy that used to come to our church, he's gone on to be with God now. We were shooting pool in the back. We, it was his shot. He put that cue stick down. He set it up there and he said, uh, I'll tell you about the time I went to prison. I said, hey man, it's your shot. Let's move on. I don't care. You're not. You're not there now. What are you going to do? In the Chronicles of Narnia, there's a particular place where the little boy and the little girl are doing something and the little boy falls off of this fictitious earth and the little girl's just sobbing and crying. Aslan, who represents God in that story, goes up to her and he's a lion and says, little girl, crying's okay for a while while it lasts. Sooner or later, you've got to get up and do something. So friends, people of hope, people online, wherever you are, I think it's time for Christians to do something. I think it's for us to, to see this as a challenge, not a futile effort. To believe if God is on our side, we can't lose. Oh, there'll be struggles. Some days it'll be painful. Some days we won't know how we're going to get through it. But because we believe in the hope that's demonstrated to us through the empty tomb and the risen Christ, we know that Christ is with us. Amen? Amen. And through that power, we have the power that Christ gives us to change the world. And friends, that's my prayer for us this year. Is that we'll be an effort. We'll make an effort. We'll do it. We'll intentionally know that we're doing the things listed here in this scripture. And when we do, I believe there'll be a great celebration in heaven. And I think heaven will be made more present to people that live around us right now. These scriptures kind of haunt me. I can't get them out of my head. They just stay with me wherever I go. Because I think God's telling me, you're not doing it yet. Quit focusing on the rules and the dogma and, and the, the sin that's all around. Start focusing on the hope and the mercy and the grace. That's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what I want to do. I hope you do too.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as you're able, would you please stand? Don't trip over the camera. Offer each other signs of peace and reconciliation. Today, any uh, donations that go in the bucket up here for our mission as you come to the altar rail go to uh, our Human Relations Day for the United Methodist Church um, as we proceed to still be a part of that global community. We're ready, John, whenever you want. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. 
You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord. Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. In his baptism and in table fellowship, he took his place with sinners. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim the release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, his death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, giving it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves praise and thanksgiving. As a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ is dying. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other. In one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Friends, we'll be serving this morning by intention, which simply means that I'll peel off a little piece of bread. I'll dip it in the grape juice for you. If you'll come forward with your hands like this, I can... Uh, give you the, the, the elements. The table is prepared. Uh, just come as you will and receive.
So friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. God is asking us to open our eyes, open our hearts, to see the needs, to see the people on the fringes and the margins, to be the church. Amen. As we close our service today, we invite you to stand as we sing where he leads me. I will follow. As you're able, would you please stand? online. We are grateful that you're with us. We worship here on Saturday nights at 5.30 and Sunday mornings at 11. You're invited to come at any time. We would love to see you here. If you come and you happen to see it online first, tell us that so we'll know. We'd just be glad to know how we connected with you. Friends that are here, we just said we'll go with him. And at the end, we said he'll go with us out into the world to be the light shining in the darkness of the love, mercy, and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go in peace. And Happy New Year. If you want to take a point set at home, feel free. We have a few. Please.